Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Paul R. Ehrlich. He's been a household name since the publication of his 1968 bestseller, The Population Bomb. He is Bing Professor of Population Studies Emeritus and President of the Center for Conservation Biology at Stanford University. Ehrlich is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a recipient of the Crawford Prize, an explicit substitute for the Nobel Prize in fields of science where the latter is not given, the Blue Planet Prize, and numerous other international honors. He investigates a wide range of topics in population biology, ecology, evolution, human ecology, and environmental science. Much of his current focus effort is focused on the mechanism of human cultural evolution and the ways of directing that evolution to ameliorate the human predicament. So first off, thank you for being on the program. Or first off, thank you for your work in the world. And second, thank you for being on the program. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I don't remember if I said this to you the last time we talked, but you know, your work has been influencing me and mine and that of the people I know since since we were children in the in the sixties and seventies. And you are uh you are in the in the top ten, I think, of the you and Yvonne Schoenard and um Doug and Chris Tompkins and at Abbey and a few others are Dave Foreman are I think the in the certainly the top ten most important environmentalists of the last half century and I just have to really thank you for your work. Well, it's really the work of a large group of people, including my wife Anne. Oh uh, yes, her too. I'm uh, absolutely. You know, she's the brains and I'm the mouth. <laughs> um. So today, you and I agreed that we were going to talk about um huge populations of creatures who have been extirpated by this culture and how that how that works and what happens so can you introduce people to um passenger pigeons and american locusts and whatever other i mean eskimo curlews great ox whatever other other creatures you would like to yeah there's a sad uh, long list i would say the <coughs> the ones most best known to the general public, of course, are the passenger pigeons, which are sort of the ultimate proof uh, that being abundant doesn't necessarily say that you're uh, going to be safe from extinction. And uh, the uh, uh, they also are vertebrates. Uh, if we were doing this show in 1890, and the TV and the radio wasn't so good back then, uh, we'd actually be talking more likely about an insect, uh, the Rocky Mountain locust. So what I'll try and do is compare them a little. Uh, the passenger pigeons flew around in huge, huge uh, flocks. Sometimes the flocks would have many millions of birds in them. Uh, they'd land in a, in a tract of forest uh, to nest. Uh, they would be so heavy that they'd break branches off of trees. There'd be so many of them. Uh, people used to be able to go into the forest uh, and uh, basically rake them up. Uh, they would get the squabs that had fallen out of nests on the squabs being young pigeons. Um, they would get more pigeons by uh, tying a, uh, catching a pigeon, tying it to a small wooden stand called a stool. Uh, other pigeons would come to try and rescue the pigeon that was tied to the stool and and bouncing around, and would then be themselves trapped under nets. Uh, that's the term, by the way, the origin of the term that some of you may know, uh, the stool pigeon in gangster movies. And um, they, they were just so super abundant that large numbers of them were shipped when railroads penetrated the Middle West um, uh, after the Civil War. Huge numbers were shipped uh, to Chicago and to the East Coast, uh, where they were um, served in restaurants. They were so common, they were even used as live targets in shooting galleries. Uh, the problem was uh, that uh, they had to have huge flocks in order to be able to successfully breed, to outnumber. They would swamp their potential enemies. Uh, and the harvesting of them slowly but surely reduced their numbers until towards the end of the uh, of the 19th century, they dwindled to so few that it was no longer economic to hunt them. Uh, and the last passenger pigeon, named Martha, after the first president's wife, Martha Washington, uh, died, I think, in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1912. So a species that would zoom past the point for hours and hours, thousands of birds, uh, a minute uh, and 
this happened repeatedly all over north, all over eastern, northeastern North America, uh, just went away. That was the end of it. And uh, it's certainly the commonest bird in North America that ever went extinct. We've had other birds go extinct, but <clears throat> that was the one that was super abundant. Um, the Rocky Mountain locust uh, was an entirely different thing. It it resembled the famous locust plagues of Africa and Central Asia. And when the plague came, and uh, uh, as I recall, it was about 1874 and 75 were the worst years. Uh, like the passenger pigeon, the locusts, which were basically grasshoppers, uh, would darken the skies. Uh, and when they landed on a in an area, they basically ate everything. They would eat virtually all the vegetation. They didn't they didn't like uh, a couple of crops, but they basically ate everything, and including um, uh, the uh, the fur of your mittens and anything else uh, when they were uh, because they were a response to hunger, basically to shortage of uh, of food. And they were so they became an issue in Congress. They led to the founding of economic entomology in North America. That is, people who were paid, in this case, uh, by states and by the government to study insects and to study particularly insects that were uh, either harmful or beneficial to humanity. And there were all kinds of efforts made to control them, none of them very successful. I mean, they actually had devices uh, which would um, uh, beat the vegetation and collect uh, bushels of the uh, insects, which would then be killed by uh, fire, usually by burning. Uh, they uh, were there were there were bounties put put on them by the bushel by states. Uh, but uh, basically, if the locust came and you were a farmer, you were just out of luck. And uh, after these huge invasions in the late part of the 19th century. Uh, the bugs began to fade away, and uh, I think the last specimens were actually caught sometime around 1902, and then they disappeared totally. And this led to uh, a uh, half a century, roughly, or a little more, of debate about why and how they disappeared. Uh, there were all kinds of ideas that the killing off of the buffalo, which occurred about at the same time, had changed their habitat so much they could no longer survive. Um, or maybe it was a climate change. Nobody really knew uh, until one scientist began to look at it very systematically. One of the questions was, was this actually uh, an ind a separate species of locust, or was it just a phase of uh, another of the same locust? That is, in, in Europe it was shown, in Africa it was shown that you had a short-winged um, locust of one color that when it got crowded uh, changed into a long-winged locust of another color and became a plague. And some people thought the one in North America, the um, grasshopper that was called the Rocky Mountain locust, uh, was actually just a phase of another common locust. But that was done away with in the uh, early part of the 20th century. But Nobody had come up with the uh, reason for their disappearance uh, until uh, the scientist that I mentioned, whose name I can't remember at the moment, but I can dredge it up, um, figured it out. Basically, the, the permanent home of the Rocky Mountain locust uh, was river valleys in the Rocky Mountains. And the river valleys turned out to be the best places in the Rocky Mountains to do agriculture. And it turns out that the locust uh, lays their eggs in sort of pods in the soil. And if you stir the soil, if you plow it or you harrow it, you expose the pods and in the winter the young die. And what basically the story of the Rocky Mountain locust was that it was a, um, uh, an abundant species when it had these outbreaks, when it, it, its breeding succeeded in producing very large numbers of individuals. Uh, but it depended on a relatively small area of habitat to survive all the time. Uh, and uh, it turned out that the, um, that, that the uh, uh, farmers, the farming, the settling of the valleys of the Rocky Mountains at the end of the 
uh, 19th century basically wiped out its breeding grounds. The guy that figured it out just came back to mind is Jeff Lockwood. Uh, he wrote a great book on it, by the way. I can't remember its title, but it's got, I think, Locust in the title. Uh, because it's not just a book about the mystery and how and and st wonderful stories of what it was like when the locust plague landed on your farm, uh, but also uh, a lot about uh, U.S. government and attitudes and culture and so on at the end, of, particularly at the end of the 19th century. So it's a book I can recommend uh, very, very highly, Jeffrey Lockwood. And it ties, by the way, to a current concern. Uh, probably most of your listeners uh, have heard about the decline of the monarch butterflies. And the monarch butterflies uh, used to be super common. Uh, I did the first part of my dissertation on them uh, back in the early 1950s. And I could buy, on a graduate student's salary, I could buy a huge vat with 100 monarch butterflies preserved in alcohol to dissect them. Uh, nowadays, of course, I wouldn't consider anything like that. Uh, but the monarchs are fading out, and they're a good example of a common species that's very much dependent on a small area for their basic uh, biology, part, part of their life, life cycle. Most of the North American monarchs go to, mountain, to mountainous forests in Mexico, not far from Mexico City. Some come to the California coast, uh, and they're all declining. One of the possible reasons for decline uh, did I, did, are we still connected? Yeah. Okay. One of the possible reasons for decline, um, is that, um, we, uh, we in introduced a parasitic fly to try and control, um, try and control gypsy moth infestations in our forest. The gypsy moth was a European moth brought here by mistake, uh, and, uh, it became a huge plague. And so, Early entomologists figured out that there was a parasite in Europe that could be moved here. They moved it here. It actually didn't control the gypsy moth very well, but it was great at eating any kind of moth or butterfly, and uh, it took on the monarch. As a matter of fact, the very first scientific paper I ever published in 1948 was, I think, the first record of this fly parasitizing a monarch butterfly. So... Um, I have a, a personal uh, bit in that particular show, but both both are all are examples of you can't count on something common being around forever. Uh, that is a, a long history of being common doesn't necessarily imply a long future of being common. So, can you go through some of the either either say what they are, or speculate on if you have a creature that's that common and then they are eradicated, that is going to have ramifications throughout the entire natural community. So, uh, what, like for example, prairie dogs, we know that they were incredibly common, and they're a species upon whom many other species are dependent. So can you talk about some of the effects on forests or prairies of the loss of these two species? Oh, well, for example, the loss of... Uh... The loss of the passenger pigeon may have had an effect on my very favorite mammal, uh, Homo sapiens, um, because the um, the passenger pigeons ate up a lot of. I got to try and remember the story, but the passenger pigeons ate up a lot of the basic food of um, various mice in the northeastern United States. The mice, therefore, uh, uh, became less common. Uh, and uh, that kept down uh, the parasite of the the pick parasites of the mice, uh, which carried Lyme disease. So when you wipe out the passenger pigeons, the mice come roaring back, the ticks come roaring back, and uh, Lyme disease is one of the uh, most uh, serious in the sense of the the medical load that it carries in the northeastern United States. I mean. I went back and visited friends and family in the horrible east uh, last summer. And there were days, a few days, of beautiful weather, unlike the usual east coast weather, uh, and lots of nice vegetation, but both uh, near uh, in New England, where I had one visit, and outside of Washington, where I had another, uh, 
you didn't dare step off the sidewalk because the ticks were so common and Lyme disease was so common. So uh, I actually possibly suffered from the absence of a passenger pigeon last summer. I did not get Lyme disease, but I was very careful because it's a nasty organism. Similar thing. Uh, oh, sorry, go on. I was just going to say another example uh, where it changes our diet in various ways is that the cod, a fish, used to be in the olden days so common that they used to say you could walk on the backs of cod uh, from Long Island to Newfoundland. They were so common in the ocean. And uh, that was a super common organism that crashed uh, that uh, the, the main reason for the crash, at least in recent days, was we developed uh, incredibly good ways of finding fish with echo sounders and so on and developed huge trawlers and basically overfished them. Caused tens of thousands of jobs among fishermen in Canada, particularly uh, full uh, protection has had to be brought back to, to resurrect the stocks. So again, um, through human activities of various kinds, is it shooting passenger pigeons or uh, farming uh, uh, river valleys in the Rockies or developing wonderful fishing techniques can take something that's very common and make it very rare very fast. Another side effect I've heard of or another ramification of the, the loss of passenger pigeons, I read a, a article 15 years ago about how um, someone thought that the collapse of passenger pigeon populations may have made the chestnut blight worse because uh, passenger pigeons would be in these huge flocks and poop so much that the soil would be very acidic underneath their favorite trees, which are often chestnuts. And the change of the uh, pH of the soil through the lack of poop may have made the chestnut trees weaker and more susceptible to blight. And my, my point in bringing that up is not whether that is that particular paper is accurate, but to show that there are all these ramifications that we don't, like you said about the mice and ticks, that you wouldn't, you wouldn't really think off the top of your head that a, there'd be a relationship between passenger pigeons and Lyme disease. Well, when, whenever you look closely at one of these situations, you tend to you find subtleties that you didn't expect. I mean, at a much simpler level, uh, Gretchen Daly and I did a study uh, of sapsuckers in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, they turned out to be relatively easy to study, but it turned out that for the sapsuckers to be there, they had to be able to have uh, sources of sap, which were primarily where we worked on the willows, uh, where they would use their, their bills to chip little uh, bits of bark away so you could start sap oozing, and then they would soak insects they collected in the sugary sap and feed their young. So you had to have willows. Uh, then you had to have trees for them to dig, uh, put, make nest holes in, and uh, that turned out to be aspen trees. And it turned out further when we studied the making of nest holes that they specialized in aspen trees that had a certain fungus that had weakened the center of the tree so that the birds could actually chip out a good nest. And it didn't stop there because it turned out that swallows in the area depended on the old nests of the sapsuckers. So you had a whole complex that, among other things, depended on a fungus uh, that uh, we just happened to discover. So the, even in the temperate zone, there are very, very subtle ecological interactions. And when you tear uh, common species uh, out of a system, it's very difficult to know what's going to happen. But the odds are that the system's going to change. And if you depend on the system in its present state uh, for, say, your food or clean air or fresh water or so on, you may be in deep trouble. I mean, the so-called insect apocalypse, you don't have to have any science to understand at all. You just have to be about as old as I am. Because in my childhood, when I traveled around the U.S., every night when I wanted to go into a bar, uh, there were lots of moths and other insects buzzing around the bar lights and the street lights. And when I drove around the United States, I'd have to stop the car periodically either to scrape the bugs off the windshield or to pull the butterflies out of the radiator because the radiator would start overheating. I you don't have that kind of experience in the U.S., at least I haven't, in a very long time. Uh, and uh, 
you really notice it if you run into some bugs, whereas they were the standard thing in the 40s and 50s and 60s. So uh, the fact that recently we've discovered that you know something like maybe half the insects on the planet are now gone and about the same amount of the rest of wildlife, uh, and that that's all happened in the last 30 or 40 years, makes looking at a future where we are utterly dependent on those other organisms not look not too bright. Something that has Are you having a drink? <laughs> something that, that happened um that made me really angry back in the eighties and nineties in was that I remember there was an editorial in a newspaper about how um a decline in the Japanese housing market was uh harming the logging industry in the Pacific Northwest because there were fewer logs going over because of the decreased housing market. And the same editorial board that recognized the interdependency of the um, of the global economy steadfastly argued that it didn't matter if salmon went extinct or if sturgeon went extinct because it's just some creature going extinct. And so my point is that they understood interdependence when it comes to the global economy, but they didn't understand interdependence. They willfully didn't understand interdependence when it came to the natural world. Yeah, of course, the salmon depended various ways on the forest. So uh, what can you say? But this is a, a standard thing today. I mean, for example, uh, the, uh, the impact that we having to feed more and more people have on the climate isn't recognized. It turns out, for example, that choosing to have, and this is a paper by a guy named Winus who did all the numbers, choosing to have one less child in terms of how much greenhouse gas goes into the atmosphere to wreck our climate is equivalent to giving up driving 22 times. In other words, if 22 people, uh, if 22 people give up driving, you can have the same saving of greenhouse gases by having one less child. Uh, do you ever see in the mass media the, the point that population growth is an absolute key to many uh, of our uh, environmental problems? Almost all of them trace to too much consumption overall, and overall consumption is uh, a product of how many people there are and how much each one consumes. Uh, and saying, as many people do, that, oh, well, the problem is all consumption, not population. It's like saying the area of a rectangle is all formed by its length, not its width. Uh, there's no way you can sort out aggregate consumption uh, from its population and per capita consumption functions. You can say which is growing faster or slower, uh, but uh, as with the rectangle, you can say you're increasing and doubling its size by doubling its width or doubling its length, but you can't say the area is caused by the width or the length. So why is it, do you think, that that carrying capacity is generally understood and accepted when it comes to every species but humans? But if we talk about carrying capacity with humans, immediately uh, people start either spitting out that you're a Malthusian um, or they um, accuse you of hating babies. Well, uh, I think there are a lot of reasons for that, but not the least of them is the growth mania of our society, of our economic system, uh, and the uh, utter ignorance of science and mathematics in most uh, human beings and certainly in most decision makers. You know, uh, as I may have said when we last talked, if you raise kids upwind of the lead smelter or downwind of the lead smelter or upwind of the fields being pesticided or downwind, you find that the upwind uh, uh, kids always have a few more IQ points than the downwind kids. And the kinds of compounds that cause that are now ubiquitous. You've got them in your bloodstream. I've got them in my bloodstream. And a lot of people think we're just dumbing down humanity. And uh, I haven't seen any, I hadn't seen any empirical evidence until recently when I began watching the Republicans in the Senate. But I think there is good evidence that we're dumbing down humanity. And uh, the educational systems are hardly helping. I mean, you can get all the way through uh, Stanford University if you take the wrong courses and have no clue what causes climate change, what's happening to biodiversity, how big the human population is, 
what you might do to reduce its size, uh, all kinds of questions. We, we don't, at the best university in the world, we don't prepare every student to deal with the major issues, the existential issues now facing humanity. And it's much worse at other universities. You know, I, I wasn't going to go this direction, but I, I think this will work. That that I and this is going to sound like it's a joke, but it, it is serious. That I sometimes wonder about human sentience, and part of the reason I wonder is because of the passenger pigeons and the Rocky Mountain locusts and the cod. That they say that one sign of intelligence is the ability to recognize patterns. But you know, we only mentioned three or four species. But there's great ox, there's prairie dogs, there's buffalo. There are uh, Mekong Delta catfish, who are the biggest uh, animal migration on the planet that's being wiped out. And we just see again and again and again, I don't understand. I mean, yeah, there's Upton Sinclair's line about it's hard to make a man understand something when his job depends on him not understanding it. But I don't understand why when there are I don't understand why people aren't screaming in the streets. I don't understand why people don't see this pattern that goes back all the way to Gilgamesh. No, oh, I I agree with you. It's it's tough to understand. You, you can say one thing. It's partly our great brains. In other words, we had a series of sudden breakthroughs. Uh, for, first of all, we don't know exactly how long ago, but maybe 80 or 100,000 years, we developed language with syntax, which gave us all kinds of advantages. Then we uh, developed agriculture, uh, which allowed us to specialize because for the first time, uh, one person could feed much more than one person, and that lets you uh, get mechanics and soldiers and priests and so on and so forth and develop science. Uh, then we had industrialization, and what we did very rapidly was evolve our technical capability, but we didn't evolve for whatever reason, but I think it's probably uh, you know sort of intrinsic. We didn't evolve our ethics and our consideration of patterns and so on as rapidly. They were never that important, uh, first of all, because evolution doesn't isn't something that recognizes. Evolution is just differential reproduction. So the people who could uh, wield the axe better, do this better, whatever, uh, they reproduced more, and their characteristics became more common in the population, whereas somebody who uh, was highly ethical, not did not necessarily reproduce more than a Donald Trump. Uh, and so uh, we, we had a split between our uh, technical evolution, which went very far and very fast, and our ethical evolution. You know, one of the things philosophers tend to say uh, is that all ethics today is just footnotes on Plato. Well, Plato was around a while ago. That's not a very rapid uh change in ethics, whereas our societies are soaking in ethical problems, you know, like what is our responsibility to do to prevent um, more extinctions and why? Uh, what's our responsibility to future generations when we keep burning fossil fuels? What's, you know, why do we treat women so badly? If you want to deal with a population problem, first thing you should be doing is giving women absolutely equal rights and opportunities everywhere and giving everyone access uh, to uh, modern contraception and, if necessary, back up abortion. But we're not doing it. So I'm with you. I'm puzzled. <laughs> um, I'm going to go a different direction now, and I'll, I'll tell a quick story of my own. People ask me often what was my introduction, how did, how did my environmental politics develop? And for me, the, the, a central moment was when I was seven, in second grade, a... Uh, subdivision was put in next to where I lived and the butterflies disappeared, the grasshoppers disappeared, the garter snakes, the the um the meadow larks, the cottonwood trees. And even in second grade I recognized where will they go if this continues? And I didn't have this language when I was in second grade, but I knew in my heart that you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. So that's my story and my question for you is um, how did you develop your how, – how did your love for the natural world develop? Well, I hate to tell you, uh, one of the, I, I've had a very lucky life. I was born at exactly the right time in 1932, so my father lost his job in the Depression, and I learned about Depression. Then I won the fight in World War II, uh, but I wasn't quite old enough. My uh, frontal lobes hadn't myelinated, so I wanted to go fight. 
Uh, and then I went to college with the last, sort of the last of the World War II veterans. And they were interested in these issues. And as a freshman and sophomore, I had long debates and we read books about just these issues. In other words, there's nothing brand new about it. There was a, uh, uh, a book by William Vogt and a book by Fairfield Osborne. Uh, one was called The Plundered Planet. I can't remember the title of the other one. And simultaneously, I saw, first of all, the places where I collected butterflies being paved over. And then I found out when I was raising monarch butterflies um, in the in the Northeast that I couldn't bring in milkweed plants to feed them because everything was coated with DDT then. They were spraying DDT everywhere. So I sort of came by it naturally, and when I got a job in graduate school, uh, uh, my first job was studying the evolution of DDT resistance uh, in fruit flies. So I got kind of academically dragged along into it by, uh, first of all, uh, veterans who were older and smarter than I was, who I lived with when I was an undergrad, uh, and then brilliant scientists who mentored me when I was a graduate student. And... Uh, that convinced me lots and lots of individual incidents that I observed, plus having people to t tie it together into a coherent story uh, when I, who I was talking to and working with. So I, I've been very, very lucky. I, I, I started my career as a scientist when the National Science Foundation was just being put together. I went through the great years of science, and now when I'm about to part to depart, uh, society is going down the drain. What can I tell you? Um, I want to go back for a moment to uh, a sentence you said early on about the passenger pigeons, about how they their their survival strategy was basically to overwhelm their predators, I presume. And um, I think about that with uh, ta tadpoles, for example, that you might have 100 babies in the hope that 1% survive to adulthood. And can you talk about uh, that as a survival strategy a little bit? Well, f first of all, <laughs> anything you have that you see regularly and seems to be rather stable means that uh, the, there's, there's one replacement for each adult in each generation, roughly. If you go beyond that, it's, uh, you know, one of the things they ought to teach in all schools, starting probably in the second or third grade, is the the pond weed story. Have I told you the pond weed story? Well, if you have a pond and you put in a weed that's going to double every day the surface of the pond it covers, and if you any of you have ever watched some pond weeds, they can go damn near that fast. And it's going to take a month for the weed to cover the entire pond. How much of the pond is covered on the 29th day? Any the answer is, of course, only half. Uh, and people don't recognize that a long history of exponential growth does not imply a long future of exponential growth. And what we've basically done in all kinds of areas uh, is done the growing up to the 29th day. And we're sitting there saying, hell, we've only used half the wildlife on the planet. Uh, we've only used half of this or half of that. Actually, we've used much more than half in many things. Uh, I can't remember what question I'm answering. Oh, it was just about about uh, um, the actually the question you're answering is much more interesting than the question I asked. The question I asked was about uh, passenger pigeons using overwhelming numbers to as a survival oh, strategy. Oh. But but the, the answer you gave I think is actually much more important and relevant to today's circumstances. Yeah, it, it, some or some organisms just develop the, if they have bad enemies. Uh, an, an example that many people in the East would know is the uh, 17, so-called 17-year locusts uh, that live underground for uh, seven, 16 plus years and then on the 17th year emerge in these vast singing swarms. And everything that can eat locusts drops everything and eats them, but there are so many of them, uh, they can't do it because they can't synchronize their own population size. In other words, if they if the predators do well uh, in the 17th year, uh, they're not going. Their offspring will starve because there aren't any locusts the next year. You got to wait another 16 years before there's a bonanza. So it's it's a not uncommon strategy uh, to uh, try and outsmart your predators. Uh, we're not that good at it, though. You know, I mean, uh, 
Uh, you can think about the fact that we're losing our antibiotics out of pure, straightforward stupidity. In other words, we knew and discussed and taught about the evolution of DDT resistance and of um, penicillin resistance back in the 50s. We knew exactly what was going to happen. We predicted it. I mean, we, the scientific community, including I was involved in that. Uh, but it's all happening, and we're still not taking any action. So uh, we're slow to be able to recognize these things, and we don't teach them right in our school systems or universities. You know, I think your your work is such a good example of of the importance of discourse. And, I mean, you have influenced me and my own work, and you've influenced so many other people. And... At the same time, as a writer myself, with you know twenty some books out, I, I, I sometimes despair because of what we're talking about. I sometimes despair at the utility of discourse too. I, you know, I think it's terrible. It's terrible in your own life, in a way. I, I have a paper still being considered on another on a topic in economics, uh, where I use the usual scientific procedure of having uh, sending it to a journal. They sent it to five different reviewers. Four came back positive and said, it's great paper, publish it. Fifth came back and said, interesting, but too many flaws in it. I don't recommend publication. And it was actually that person's review that was most valuable to me because some of the things uh, he didn't understand or she didn't understand, uh, I had not, in my view, written clearly enough. And some of the things he, she said uh, were new to me and, and made it better. In other words, Discourse, I don't think I'm always right. No scientist thinks they're always right. No scholar thinks they're always right. And one of the great things about scholarship and science is how you can benefit from discourse, from discussion, uh, from having to prepare a course and persuade smart undergraduates that uh, what you think. And often they'll point out that they, you don't think right, and that's good. So uh, I, I think life would be miserable. Uh, if everybody had to accept everything I said or you said. Well, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't have disagreement. I, I'm just. I the re part of the reason I despair is because you can put out your cogent analysis. Other people can put out their cogent analysis, and like you said, these aren't new issues. Yet, um, in the real world, insect populations are still collapsing. Uh, they're still putting in new mega dams, and and. Yeah, I think discourse is really important, but I, I the the how do, you, how do you change it exactly? And and I again, I want to say that your that your work, you know, has been has ramified. It's like I don't know if you know Neil Everenden's work, but his work has been really central to mine too. In that I was browsing in a library in Spokane, Washington, in '87 or '86 or somewhere in there, and uh, his book jumped off the shelf at me, and it was the first book I ever read that didn't take, that, that, that talked explicitly about the inherent value of creatures and not just their economic value, and that creatures are important for their own sake, and species are important for their own sake, and also for the sake of the natural community. And this book saved my sanity and changed changed everything about how I, about my work in the future. So yeah, it does help. But then that doesn't alter the fact that Mekong Delta catfish are still getting hammered. No, but they may be hammered less because of your efforts in spreading the word. In other words, uh, I keep hoping that, you know, I, I know perfectly well if I talk to an audience of 5,000 people, I'm lucky if I get one or 2,000, uh, one or two, who will actually do something and actually take some kind of action. But you got to start someplace. Uh, I mean, I've been very, I remember last time we talked about the book Jaws, uh, and I thought it would really attract people because it's a way that people, it tells a way that people can actually uh, solve one of the existential problems, at least for their children. Uh, and uh, it's sold fine, but it has never really taken over, and people still, I looked on the web the other day, and uh, the the web med and other sites like that say malocclusion, that is crooked teeth, are caused by poor dentists and heredity. And in fact, they're caused almost entirely by us becoming industrial, by the huge environmental change uh, that all human beings are now being subjected to.
and you wonder, you know, even if it's something where people can be helped personally, uh, they don't seem to want to pay attention. And I think it tells us a lot about the standards of our society, the the financial centering of everything. You know, GDP is everything. Getting more is everything. You know, do you really need the latest iPhone, you know, one every six months? More it is more and more stuff making people happy. I don't think so. There were all the studies that are done of happiness show that while GDP has increased enormously and the amount of stuff has increased enormously and so on, uh, satisfaction, contentment, happiness have not been increasing anywhere. If anything, they're decreasing in many parts of the world, which means we need to look at even more fundamental changes in society, which I don't see much prospect for. Sorry to say that. Did you want to talk a little bit more? I know this is a different subject than the passenger pigeons, etc., but you brought up JAWS, and did you want to talk about any... Why don't you give, since you just mentioned that, why don't you give like the one-minute version of that and then talk about new things you've understood since the book came out? Well, what the, the, the basic thing, which I, as an evolutionary biologist, I was shamed by not recognizing that more and more people are getting, more and more kids are getting um, braces, more and more kids are walking around with their jaws hanging open. More and more adults, including my daughter, are on CPAP machines to help them breathe at night. So-called obstructive sleep apnea is waking more and more people up at night, which is a horrible stressor and leads to heart disease and Alzheimer's disease, the various dementias, cancer, uh, ADHD, highway accidents, all kinds of things. And I hadn't recognized it. It was pointed out to me by Dr. Sandra Kahn, a colleague in conservation work who was also an orthodontist and was really worried about this situation. So uh, the, the cause of this is obvious. That is, when you look at hunter-gatherers or even uh, people 500 years ago, there are no wisdom teeth. They all have uh, all three molars on each side. The wisdom teeth just being the third molar that's getting crowded out of our shrinking jaws. Our jaws are getting smaller, uh, and there is no malocclusion. The teeth in the skulls, if you dig up Danish skulls from 400 years ago, in general, the jaws are smaller than today. There's very little malic, very little crooked teeth, uh, and uh, uh, no wisdom teeth because they, the bowlers just come in. They don't get extracted. Uh, so... Uh, Sandra and I wrote a book called Jaws, pointing out the things you could do with your kids to avoid this trend uh, and, and trying to figure out exactly what was causing the trend. I'm not sure we were totally right there, uh, but there's no question at all that none of it has anything to do with genetic change or heredity. Uh, and uh, we found that very depressing, although more and more orthodontists and so on are getting interested in the issues. So, uh, you know, it's a non-profit book, Jaws, the story of a hidden epidemic. The hidden epidemic is hitting us hard. It's costing huge amounts of money, all kinds of distress, and it's something uh, that we can change. It's part of a general trend of bringing Stone Age genes into an industrial world. Uh, a similar thing is happening, for instance, to eyesight. That is, nearsightedness is getting common and commoner in some populations that have are totally addicted to cell phones and kids are losing the ability to see as well as they could because of the way they're dealing with the modern environment of cell phones and changed light regimes. So that, you know, it's, it's a place where you can actually, if you have kids and you want to know how to tell whether their jaws are going in the right direction, particularly if they're very young, because it's easier to change things in youngsters than in, say, kids over seven or eight. Um, get a copy of Jaws out of the library. It's not expensive, and any if you buy it, any profits go to uh, the, the effort to change the world. But uh, it's something you can actually do. You can't do much about climate change. You can't do much about toxins because they're everywhere. But you can do something about whether your kid keeps their mouth closed uh, between uh, words when they're speaking and how they sleep at night and so on and so forth. And there's a long list of things you can do. So we have about three or four minutes left, and you've already talked about the pond weeds, but is there something else that you would like to say? Sort of the theme, general theme for today has been large population creatures who have been wiped out. And is there anything else you want to say about uh, 
population dynamics, um, about exponential growth, about... Oh, I know one thing I want to say. I read, I read that article a couple days ago that somebody sent out to a whole bunch of newspapers, and they're all, none of them are going to take it probably, about how people keep saying that population is going to level off at 10 billion and that at some point in the future they will have a zero growth economy. So if they're going to level off at some point, why don't they level off now? <laughs> I think we're, we're too big now. But, you know, again, uh, we're losing biodiversity. We're in the middle of a sixth mass extinction episode. It's not just insects and birds. It's mammals and everything else we look at are disappearing, all of which are involved one way or another in our own lives and our own happiness. So that's an absolutely uh, critical thing. I think another thing that uh, we have to watch is the social side of things. In other words, I mentioned that inequities that women face are one of the reasons the population is exploding still. Uh, and inequities in economics and so on, among other things, deprives us of the uh, efforts to solve these problems of many people who only have to struggle to live. That is, we have a lot of people with much too much money and many too many people, maybe two billion, that can't afford even to have the proper micronutrients in their meals. Uh, and so uh, the equity issues are big in all of this uh, because we need to solve them in order to solve the existential threats. And uh, I guess semi-finally, I would, or finally, I would say, pay more attention to the nuclear war situation. We do not say anywhere is near enough about U.S. efforts to improve the so-called triad, that is the, the bombers, the submarines, uh, and the uh, uh, land-based missiles, which we have thousands of, just like the Russians do, and which is absolutely insane. We could easily, even a small nuclear war between India and Pakistan would end the U.S. and Europe as we know it, uh, and the chances of an accidental war between the Soviet, uh, between the Russians and the Americans is worse now than it ever was during the Cold War, uh, and not in any small degree to the actions taken by the Obama and Trump administrations. So uh, learn about the nuclear situation, because if we have a large-scale nuclear war, the entire conversation we've just had is moot. That, that would be a great place to end on, but I thought of another image of yours that I would like to, to bring up, if you don't mind. Um, that one species may disappear and it may not affect a natural community, but if more and more species keep disappearing, then at some point the entire thing falls apart. It's kind of like there's a... The, the rivet hopper. It's the yes. rivet hoppers. Yes, exactly. Is, if you're wandering out to take a commuter airliner someday uh, and you see a guy on a ladder popping, I, I like this because I'm a pilot, uh, popping rivets out of the wing. You stop and say, what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm popping the rivets out. Uh, you you know, uh, Jones Airlines can sell each one of them for five bucks. And it increases our bottom line. And you say, my God, but you're, you're, you're taking rivets out of the wing. Uh, you won't that cause the airplane to crash? Nah, there's lots of redundancy in the rivets. You don't have to worry. We never take that many out. Well, uh, of course, uh, much of what happens to an airplane's wing depends on how hard the landing is, whether you're flying through a thunderstorm and so on and so forth. But I think any sane person wouldn't fly with Jones Airline. They'd go smile, fly with Smith Airline that doesn't have a policy of knocking, taking rivets out of the wing. And it's the same thing with knocking off elements of biodiversity. We don't know the functions of the vast number of species, of the many millions of species that are on the planet or the billions of populations, of some of which are different. We don't know their vulnerabilities. We don't know their functions. And we don't know what environmental conditions they're going to encounter. Uh, so uh, pulling out species is like pulling the rivets out of a plane's wing. Things may go on just fine for a while, and then one day something will happen, spoil your whole day because the wing will come off. Well, thank you so much for your incredible work in the world. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Paul Ehrlich. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.